Okay, three people are awake. This is great. Good afternoon. Okay, we're nearly there, friends. We're nearly there. Uh, my name's Nicholas Badminton. You can call me Nick. And I hope to chat to a, a whole bunch of you after, after my keynote. And uh, this, th I just really want to say thank you very much to Becky and Steve and the entire team that's uh, put on this event. It's been incredibly insightful. I think that there's been some amazing uh, speakers. I really loved what Thomas had to say as well. It sort of sets me up nicely for what I'm going to talk about today, which is Agriculture 3.0. Now, I'm a futurist, so I look out 5, 10, 20 years into the future and try and work out where we're going to be, but I talk about today. But really, I talk about where I come from as well. When I started talking to farming audiences, I started talking about where I came from. This is, this is a, for a view from a place called Ham Hill. It's about three miles from a village called Martok that I grew up 19 years of my life in. 5,000 people, a slaughterhouse in the center of town that my father ran, a bakery that my mother worked in. I ended up working for, for dairy farmers there as well for, for a number of years. And it's really interesting. When I saw the changes in the first 20 years of my life in this place, suddenly we saw the slaughterhouse disappear and it moved about 15 miles away which is actually particularly good, because in the summer, every two weeks, they'd empty the blood tanks. And you can imagine what that was like. We went from having several dairy farmers to only having one dairy farmer. We, we went from being uh, a village that was defined by farming to a village that was a satellite village of a town just 10 miles away. And when I think about that, and I think about the change that is coming to the world, in our world, I think about resiliency. I think about innovation, I think about diversity, and I'm going to talk about all three of these things. But really, when I was about eight years old, my dad gave me a book, and this is it, the Osborne Book of the Future. And in this book, page after page of amazing ideas and innovations about where we're going to be, a lot of it didn't come true, and a lot of it is very provocative, and it came from scientists and people at Boeing and, and people at Raytheon and Isaac Asimov, and it was really inspiring to me. And this started me on my journey to think about, wow, what if? What if the world was different? So oftentimes we're stuck in what is reality today. But I like to invite people to be curious and to be creative, to co consider a new way, and to ask, what if the world was different? What if we make a choice to have a new business model or a new technology involved in our operations? What happens then? What if we make that change? And that's what this entire presentation is about, what if? And I always like to start off by talking about industrial revolutions. What if we continue the revolution? So if we go back to about 9 BC, we can see that commercial agriculture in terms of being on a village or a tribal scale really came to be. And fast forward to the 1760s, 1780s, 1800s, and that creation of the first industrial revolution that changed everything. Fossil fuels was one of the things that, that really thrust us into this new world. And there's three parts of an industrial revolution that we need to recognize exist that, that cause that change. Accelerated communications, accelerated energy, accelerated transportation. And at the nexus of these three things and all of the innovations within them, we see growth in GDP and population and urban centers. We see bigger needs for, for more food, more products and new businesses to service the people in the world. And that presents us with a paradox. So over the last 200, 250 years, we've had it good. And life is abundant, or so we think. But the paradox is this, and we've already seen a number of speakers talk about this. We've got climate change happening, and it's fundamentally changing how the world's operating. Extreme weather conditions, our businesses, the largest companies in the world, trillion dollar companies, are worried about this because they're, they're worried about how they're going to continue to operate all the way down to small holding farms. Now, when I go to take stats on climate change, I've been very careful and, you know, there's a very lively conversation about what's true, what's not true. So I actually take it from the US Army College. 
that wrote a report that's absolutely terrifying. And there's a link there, and I've actually just, just shared a link to it on Twitter. So do, do go away and read that. Because there's going to be a number of things that, that come and affect us. And this is at a macro level. When I say us, I'm talking globally. So extreme weather events. Dr. Lumpkin spoke about Australia and a number of other things and the fires. That's one example. Jakarta's underwater right now. P parts of Florida are going underwater. My apartment in Vancouver is going to be a waterfront property in about 150 years. I don't know whether that's going to be good for the price, right? Probably not. Boat access is something that I didn't plan for. But decrease in our Arctic sea ice. They're, they're thinking that soon you're going to be able to sail directly over the top of the Earth. And what's really interesting, if we come back to home and we start to think about power and the supply here, drought and warming is going to put undue stress on the electricity grid, which is not easy to upgrade. So this, these are just three things from that, that US Army report that I talk about. And if you go through, there are dozens of pages that really give you the insight. So I, I really sort of encourage you to go away and, and read about that, because climate change is absolutely real, and it will change the world. But now we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Digitized communications are, are moving information faster than ever before. Renewable energy, automated transportation and logistics. And I'm going to talk about some of these things as we go through this presentation. So, Let's move to energy. What if we choose renewable energy? What if that redefines what energy is? By 2040, renewables will be about 75% of the investment that we're going to have to make in the $10.2 trillion that's going to be invested. It's actually cheaper to run renewable infrastructure for energy than it is with coal and, other, and nuclear and, and other sources. And we're seeing some amazing projects happen. Now, this is Yuma, Arizona, the Agua Caliente solar plant. And what's interesting is it displaces about 220,000 tons of CO2 annually. We're also seeing incredible projects down in Australia, like the Hornsdale Wind Farm. Elon Musk got in touch with them, put in a massive Tesla battery underneath. And in the first year of operation, they paid off about a third of the investment that they, they, they spent, about 90 million Australian dollars to, to put in, in the first year alone. The business model is incredible. And then you can see farming operations. Now, this is a winery that uses solar, 100% electricity. And then they put the rest of the electricity back into the grid, and they earn money from that. So faster returns on capital outlay. The idea of putting solar panels over the top of crops is something that's taking off. This is a picture from Germany. This is how farmers think about innovation. We know that there's. There's been a trend, especially down in the States, of earning more money from your land by putting solar farms on it than the crops that you could grow. Imagine doing both, right? That's smart thinking. That's smart thinking that comes from farmers. And anaerobic digesters. I was chatting to someone at dinner last night, and we had a very excited conversation about anaerobic digesters for about half an hour. Right. And that conversation was fascinating to me, because suddenly you could take a farm that, that raises cattle, and suddenly you can use the, uh, the excrement from the cattle in new ways, being completely independent of the power grid and earning money by putting power back into it. And what goes with this is, is the idea that you know, we need to store that energy and release it when we need it. I mean, when we're looking at, at wind or we're looking at solar, you know, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow but batteries are going to be there to store the energy that we need when we need it. That convenience is, is coming because it's getting cheaper and cheaper to buy battery infrastructure. And there's new kinds of batteries going from lithium ion to sodium ion. And even, even large companies like IBM are saying they've got completely new ways. They're not going to tell us yet, but completely new ways of, of thinking about storage of electricity. It's, a, it's an exciting world. And over the last four or five years, it's probably the area that has got the most chatter and the most development, and probably the most investment that I'm seeing out there. And this is the idea of the future. If you think out to 2060, 2080, this is how the world's going to look. This is how some people are saying, you know, what if we were going to connect every country on the planet with an interconnected renewable energy grid where electricity is almost free and it's shared 
effortlessly and traded between countries at very, very low rates per kilowatt hour. What if, what if this was going to be the case? And they're already trialing this out in Asia, and they're trialing it in the North Sea across European countries. This is a future that's very much going to happen. Geopolitics is going to get in the way of a lot of the, uh, the negotiations of how this is going to work. Try, uh, try traversing the Bering Strait with electricity into Russia. Yeah. And is this a wild idea? Well, we're all connected to the internet, right? And this is how the internet works. Cables under the sea. Cables across countries. Why, why can't the electricity grid work that way? It absolutely can. But if we've got all this abundant electricity in the future, what about the electrification of transportation? I just want to see a show of hands. Who ordered the, the Tesla Cybertruck? Did you see this, yeah? Brutalist, doesn't look like anything else. My, I had to talk my girlfriend off the ledge of ordering one of these. It's amazing, I need to order it. It's like my friends were sending me images of their order screens on their mobile phones. 250,000 people put a pre-order in on a promise of something that's going to come in and disrupt the, the, the trucking industry, um, sorry, the, the light trucking industry uh, in, in North America and beyond. Now, these cars are going to be powerful. Okay, so who, who, who drives a Ford F-150 in the room? Yeah, a lot of people. Now, you, you could have, within a year or two, uh, an electric F, F-150. Here it is, Ford showing what it can do. It's pulling a million pound load on rail tracks. A million pound load. They're going to be faster. They're going to be stronger from a torque perspective. The batteries are going to last six, seven, eight hundred miles eventually. And they're going to be dirt cheap to run and dirt cheap to maintain because they don't have a combustion engine that's got over 200 parts in it. They've got electric drivetrain, which is like three parts that never break. You will have to replace the windscreen washers, uh, washer fluid once in a while, right? But what, 15 bucks a year. But electrification is coming to transportation very, very quickly. We're seeing, seeing the Tesla semi-truck top left. And then we're seeing car ferries in Norway. Norway's going deep on, on electric, electrification of its infrastructure. Car ferries, fully electric. In China, they've got container ships that are fully electric. They go, this, this one goes up and down the Yangtze River. About 40 miles every day, it takes about two hours to unload it. In those two hours, it completely recharges and goes back down the river. Ironically, they take coal up the Yangtze. Sounds like a euphemism, doesn't it? But in China, and look to China for a lot of the developments around the electrification of transportation, they're deploying about 9,000 buses every couple of months to new cities. Guangzhou is a 100% electric bus fleet now. Why is China going so deep on, on renewables? Why is it going so deep on electrification? It has to bring in all of its own, like, it has to bring in coal and, and gas and, and oil, and it wants to be completely independent. By 2030, China will be the number one country in terms of size, in terms of GDP, India second, and US third. But what to the fields? Let, let's think about tractors. Now, the, the Fen e E100 Vario is super interesting to me. It's got about five hours of runtime, which isn't really going to work for us, but we're getting there. And smaller tractor applications with, with battery on board are providing us a sustainable way to run clean operations in, in a farming context. And then it gets super interesting to me because I start thinking about data and artificial intelligence and new developments in transportation. And then I was like, what about swarm farming? What if we develop a new way of working with swarms of machines? Autonomous vehicles. It's going to take a long time for that to hit the roads out, out here in Des Moines and, and large cities like Toronto where I live. But in the fields? It can be there today. And we've got autonomous vehicles. The, the, second, the, the, the top right is John Deere's idea of an autonomous electric vehicle. It's fascinating. It's got 1,000 meters of electrical cable at the front. Why? So it can run, plugged in to the wall. Right? Yeah, I'm not even joking. I was astounded. Creativity, curiosity, what if? What if we solve that problem of, of not having enough battery power during a day? Small Robotics, a small robot company from the UK. Fascinating, little applications of robots. 
And then robots that can actually be in the fields today, weed killing precision, with precision, saving you money. So it's fascinating. Swarms of these in the future, in your farms, whilst you're back at the HQ in your high-tech control center, wearing your lab coat and big sunglasses. I don't know. I get carried away. But in the UK, there, there's some projects really pushing the boundaries. Uh, there's a project called the Hands Free Hectare, where these students and, and these innovators are coming together to think about what if we can operate a hectare of, of wheat fully autonomously, using drones, using tractors, using combines. And they're doing it, and it's really interesting. And slowly they're proving it out efficiency. And drones. Some people in the room may already use drones in their operations. Amazing for capturing information, amazing for doing crop walks, and a number of other things. Surveillance of your crops. Investment banks actually fly drones over the top of some of the fields just to see how things are as well, right? That's another story. And then it's super interesting to me. You know, I was reading about bee populations being affected. What happens if the bees disappear? Well, in Harvard, they're working on something called the robo-bee. And imagine swarms of robo-bees doing what bees do today, but programmed on an ongoing basis. You know, it can help us really deal with CCD and, and other problems that we have to deal with. So it's pretty exciting times. Energy, transportation, autonomous vehicles, small robots, swarm farming. Sounds like a pretty interesting future to me. What if that's your future? But then it gets super interesting to me because empowering you is exactly what technology needs to do. What if we empower farmers? What if we look to things like the Farmers Business Network to help with you know, dashboards on, on what's happening on the farm, social connection, purchasing inputs, and other things? This is really shaking things up in Canada, and a lot of chatter about this. And it's making some of the very large companies, the service providers, really, really nervous. Because we're putting the power back in your hands. Farm R is a company out of the UK. It's like the Airbnb of farm equipment. There's clearly some farm equipment that, that isn't used at all year round. And maybe someone else can use it. And sometimes the three or four people in your cell phone or the people that know you just isn't a big enough network. Maybe you can earn money by, by renting out this equipment. I, I find this to be incredible. Shakes it up. Shakes up the idea of ownership. And then what about social media telling our story? If you haven't checked this out before, go and find this guy, the millennial farmer. He increases knowledge, he takes people into the cab, he takes his wife along. He, he tells the story about what you do. And what's really funny is he earns more money from YouTube every year now than he earns from farming by telling the stories. So it's interesting how the modern world and the platforms that are available give us new avenues for revenue, diversity in revenue. And then open source systems get really interesting to me. This is a couple of things, Ag Open GPS and Agrobot. These are platforms that you can put into your equipment. You know, so you've got a roller here, yeah? And you can control it from your smartphone. Open source, free to use. And there's a bit of hardware that you need to pay for, but a farmer can be in a field, and it's like one step away from full autonomy. It's like, that can do what it needs to do, and I can control it here, and I can do what I need to do. That's a really cool idea. And because it's open source, it means that we have control. On the flip side of this, there's a lot of conversation about the right to repair. We're smart people. We can apply our knowledge and be practical and repair the equipment on our farms. But licensing agreements with large providers means that we're not allowed to, or we have to use authorized dealers. But we want to take back control. Now, here, here we've actually got a, a map of a number of places that have considered uh, digital right to repair le legislation. Nebraska in December are really leading the charge on this. What's fascinating as well, and someone sent me a, a news report the other day. Tractors from 70, the 70s and 80s are in high demand and they're actually increasing in value because you can repair them yourself. 
isn't it incredible to think that a business model would stop you from doing your job and making your life more expensive? So there's a wake-up call for many, many equipment manufacturers. I'm pretty sure many of you would like to see. But I've talked about data and artificial intelligence and what if we get access to that and can work with people can, that can really exploit that. You know, it helps us with our yield planning, strategic planning, risk management, operations equipment management, a number of things, education, augmented reality so as you walk around crops and maybe you can see that information in front of you, in front of the fruit that's there, fed to you from sensors and artificially intelligent machine learning platforms. This empowerment's incredible. IBM's done some really interesting stuff in, in terms of agronomy. Growers can now film a field of corn from, from a drone and use AI-enabled visual recognition analysis to identify crop disease or pest infestation. Really useful applied ways of, of using technology like drones and artificial intelligence. I can react in real time and won't lose yield waiting for the agronomist. Now, agronomists aren't going to be out of a job. Agronomists are going to use these things as their tools, and it's going to make them more effective, and they're going to be definite parts of your lives. But access to this data is, is going to be a game changer for farming operations. And then I live in Toronto, and I, I think about food supply, and I've got friends that run all sorts of farming operations on top of universities. It, it's a fascinating place. Toronto grew faster than any other city in North America last year. It added 80,000 people to the city. I moved there last year. That's an incredible amount of growth. And we're going to see cities around the world growing to be bigger than ever before. Mega cities are going to completely change the dynamics of continents like Africa. In 2100, they estimate that Lagos, Nigeria will be 88 million people in size. How are they going to feed themselves? What if we think about growing crops within the city limits? Rotterdam in, in Holland is really interesting. Dairy farmers, awesome. I, I, I lived in uh, British Columbia for 11 years. Lots of people out in Abbotsford that are Dutch, doing an amazing job raising cattle. Uh, a floating dairy farm in Rotterdam. Yeah. So you use different, different ways of finding a place to grow the food that we need. The Sky Farm at this hospital in Indianapolis, right? growing the food for the people that are actually part of this health, health facility. Makes a lot of sense to me. It shortens that distance, that logistical dis distance. In Detroit, if you've, go, if you've been to Detroit recently, it's exciting and vibrant, but wow, it, challenging. My girlfriend's from Windsor, so we go to Detroit quite a lot, super cool. The people there are great and they're driven. People like the Detroit People's Food Co-op, D-Town Farm, and the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, about 80% of women, 80% of those organizations are women, and they're black inner city families that are growing their own food. Diversity of, in the farming community, it's amazing, the things that can be done when we work together. And giving opportunities to people in new ways. Elon Musk's brother, Kimball, runs this company called Square Roots, and he uses container, containers from container ships to help people start their own agribusinesses, growing and innovating, um, growing microgreens or whatever within city limits. I, I find it fascinating and very, very cheaply as well. It's interesting, the use of containers for buildings and whatever is going to become more prevalent as well. About 18% of all the containers in the world are never used. Right? So let's use them for something. And then maybe you can go to the supermarket and you can actually buy the food that's growing there. And companies like IKEA are starting to sell home grow, grow units and it's becoming fascinating to me. And then what about genetics? We've heard that spoken a lot about today. CRISPR-Cas9, the ability to edit DNA with RNA proteins, to chop and change it to make things more resilient, to, to remove problems. And yes, there's going to be challenges as we work out how that's going to work from a regulation and policy perspective. But you know, maybe we can grow tomatoes in a more sustainable way and, and less food can go to waste. Less, le, less, fewer of the plants can die. Maybe we can take black and white Holstein cattle and uh, engineer horns away, right? Improving their health. And male pigs that never reach sexual maturity Avoiding the boar taint that can make pork chops unpleasant. 
It's going to be one of the biggest game changers in the world. The idea of genetically modifying crops, genetically modifying animals, maybe humans eventually. And there's some amazing people working in this. So Professor Eleanor Riley from the Rosinen Institute. Genes can be modified to massively increase resistance and resilience to infection. The health and welfare benefits of this could be enormous. There are people that are really betting their entire careers on this. Billions of dollars is going into this in industry. And we've already seen a lot of people like, before the butcher, you know, challenging the idea around plant-based protein. It's coming into supermarkets. And why? Because the meat market is so big. It's going to be worth about $7.3 trillion by 2025. A huge increase in demand. People want protein. They want it to be sustainable as well. We're not going to be able to raise cattle, chickens, pigs, as much as we need to. Challenges with disease around the world. African swine flu, right? Here was a picture from my local supermarket that I took last week. This is what you call absolute industry disruption. Beyond beef, which is not beef, it is plant-based plant protein, sat in the middle of the meat aisle. Are we going to suddenly have protein aisles? And why is it in the middle of the, the meat aisle? And if you notice, it doesn't have a price on it. The people that, that go for it, are going to pay whatever to have that experience and also to choose that as an option in their lives. And sure, they might eat sausages, they might have pork chops, they might whatever, but they might eat this sometimes as well. But this is an absolute disruption in an industry because it's sitting in the same place in the supermarket. A lot of fights are happening somewhere. The Impossible Burger, it's spoken about earlier today, now they got pork substitute. Why? Sell it to the Chinese. It deals with a big problem over there right now. And that's their strategy. Disruption, come in. When there's a problem, hey, here's a safe alternative. They just need to up their, their supply. And they're going to build billion dollar businesses that change the world. And this is a chicken called Ian. Now, Ian's still alive and he lives in Southern California on a farm. He's retired. He, works, he used to work for a company called Just. And what Just did, they took some of his cells and they grew chicken from it. So chicken breasts from chickens that never die. It was actually Winston Churchill that spoke about this, I think in like the 1950s. He says it's ridiculous to kill a chicken just to have a chicken breast. And he, said, he foretold this kind of a future. If you read some of Winston Churchill's oldest, old, oldest writings, it's fascinating. He was a true visionary. He was a very salty old guy as well, interesting guy. In two months, 50,000 tons of pork cells could be grown per bioreactor. Dr. Lumpkin talked about that as well. By using starter cells from 10 pigs, the pigs don't die. Wow, we can make sure that those pigs are super healthy, take their cells, and grow pork. Why not? And then it gets really funky. There's an agency down in Silicon Valley that talks about disruption in industries, and they launched a report on agriculture last year. And they say that the number of cows in the US will have fallen by 50% by 2030. And that the, the cow industry, the cow farming industry will be all but bankrupt. Now, I read this and I was like, you know, I, I just don't buy that. And if you, if you start to think about this and you start to think about their rationale, it's really interesting. It takes a long time to raise a, like a cow before you can slaughter it. It might just take weeks to grow the same amount of protein. So why, why would we go for that protein? Because it's going to be more sustainable. It's going to be available in places where it's very difficult to raise cattle. And again, I'm looking at a macro perspective around the world. And it's called unbundling the cow. A future with cellular protein is, is absolute and going to happen. We'll, we may not all choose to have it, but do you know what? A lot of people will. Now, I'm a futurist, and I help some of the world's largest companies and investment funds think about that future horizon, 5, 10, 20 years into the future. But what if we can all become futurists? I mean, everyone thinks about the future every single day. We worry about it. We're scared about what could be coming. 
And this is the biggest tool that I have, doubt. I look at everything, I watch every presentation, I read every book, I have conversations, and at the back of my mind is doubt on everything, and proof, and science, and opportunity, and empathy for different people's situation. And I need to doubt everything that I see so that I can prove that what I'm talking about makes a lot of sense. And, and there's something called Amara's Law that says this. In the short term, we tend to overestimate the impact of technology. You might think that the majority of this presentation was complete overestimation of what that impact could be. But over time, and this, is, this has been seen thousands of times with technologies, we tend to underestimate the impact of technology in the long run. Right? Mobile phones, there's going to be 6 billion smartphones in the world this year. That's more people with access to cellular technology than access to clean running water. AT&T back in the late 80s, early 90s, didn't believe that this was the future. So whilst the world moved towards that destination, they suddenly panicked about five years into, into the uptake of the technology and had to pay $100 billion for a new company that had been you know, working in that area and pioneering it to get back in the game. Right? So the technologies I spoke about today, they're all going to be in the world, and they're going to be at scale. So what if we take a step forward and entertain the idea that it could really help our operations? So here's an exercise I actually use with my clients. Setting hypotheses, doing scenario building. What if in a future year, we deploy solutions, X, Y, and Z, some of the innovations? Then we see these positive outcomes. It's like writing science fiction. So what, what if in 2030 we install solar and EV, electric vehicles and then our power costs will be reduced by 50%? Wouldn't that be great? If we think about that in the future, you can actually work backwards and think about what you need to do to get to that point in time. Strategic planning with a longer view. What if in 2042, some say is the year of the singularity, we mobilize swarm tech and then we become 100% automated and focus on cellular protein? Do you think companies like Google are looking at this or Amazon are looking at this? They absolutely are. Are they looking out that far? Probably not. But will they invest in companies like this? Absolutely. We're already seeing big tech investing huge amounts of money in agricultural technologies and innovations. But what if we look at the year 2220? Now, I was at dinner last night and I gave a teaser to some people about looking out this far. So why, why would we look out that far? Well, it's, it's a chance for me to flex my, my story writing abilities. So I'm calling 2220 a new ag frontier. It's been 150 years since the end of the energy wars, and 100 years since any war on earth has been waged. Energy is very controversial from a war perspective. The world has never been so unified in a mission to support all 15 billion beautiful humans to thrive. Our global economy is enabled digitally, and international trade has never been so good. Sustainable agriculture is at the forefront of that ecosystem evolution. We are the heroes today and will be the heroes of the future. A core part of this, this success is the global food supply network. It runs using the global internet of energy, data sensors, and real-time aware intelligence that informs farmers, scientists, and innovators to drive humanity forward more than ever before. A core goal was to create a diverse and equitable platform for rural and urban farmers, large and small, around the world. And we're exceeding that today in 2220. Our farming community will be diverse in nature, with a majority of women leaders and groups we see underrepresented today. With the support and empowerment from all levels of industry, government, and consumers, we're going to change the world. Agriculture, a story that started thousands of years ago, is still our story. It runs faster than ever. It's a story of resilience, innovation, diversity, and community. It, its business is food, technology, DNA, and more. And that approach is contagious, with effects spreading to other industries. The Industrial Revolution is no more. We've moved from industry to humanity. And it's interesting, as I start to write science fiction to make people think about that future, what if the world can be different entirely? And how do we work back from a future vision that may seem science fiction and incredible to start making changes today? And at Christmas, I was chatting to my mother-in-law, and she reads a ton of poetry. And she says, 
oh, you're going to talk in Iowa? You're going to talk to farmers? Do you know who Wendell Berry is? And she said, you need to read Manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front. And it's a long poem, so I, I don't have it here. But I've just taken a, a, a small chunk of that, and I think it defines about what we need to do today. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant. You will not live to harvest. And that kind of underscores what I think Agriculture 3.0 will be. Planning for a future today. And not just thinking, you know, we have to deal with what is right in front of us right now. Sure, that defines our industry today. But what if the future can be different? What if we can be curious? And what if we can ask those questions to redefine what agriculture can be? Thank you very much.